please welcome to the stage Brian Kelly, Editor and Chief Content Officer, U.S. News and World Report. Ronald Smalley, Vice President, Cybersecurity Operations and Investigations, First Data. Francis Townsend, Executive Vice President of Worldwide Government, Legal and Business Affairs, McAndrews and Forbes, Inc. And Josh Calmer, Senior Vice President of Global Policy, Information Technology Industry Council, to the stage. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about cyber security and the issue of uh, the, the, the tension that exists between uh, the need for security and the need for innovation and how uh, in a globalized digital economy it's everybody's business. Um, how many folks here ha have a Yahoo account, uh, had a Yahoo account um, that's now being read by the North Koreans? Um, how many folks have their credit ratings uh, being read by the Romanians? Uh, uh, how many folks are in the fake news business? Um, <laughs> not intentionally, yeah. Thank you. Michelle raised her hand. From, Michelle from CBS, I'm with US News. It, no, our news is not fake. But, but um, just, I just, you know, to, to set the stage here that the, the, it, cyber is, is not just this obscure uh, national security issue, which it is, but it also involves your bank account, your personal information, uh, and so much that has to do with business and commerce. So we've got three terrific people here to help us tease this issue out and, and begin to understand uh, how I think the question that we're going to frame it as, where's, how do you draw the balance? How do you manage the imperative of security uh, with the, the necessity of innovation and growing this, this phenomenal uh, tool, uh, digital digitization, which has changed the people's lives in five years and is going to change it enormously in the next five. So let me start with, with Ron. Ron, give us a quick overview of, of your group. And, um, you know, First Data is, uh, you know, catch us up on that because everybody knows what First Data is except they don't know what it is. Sure, it's, yeah, it's in the, everything. Yeah, the, the biggest company that, that, that you don't often uh, know about. But in, in short, Right? For when you go use your payment device, whether it's a credit card, whether it's your, your phone, or whether it's an e-commerce, and, and you make that transaction, we're the one that connects you from that merchant terminal or from that, or for, that to, for that device to the bank, and we make that transaction happen. So we process transactions for over 6 million merchants, 4,100 banks in, in 118 you know, or so countries internationally, and that's what we do. We connect, we connect you from the merchant to the bank and make that transaction go through. All right, and when we talk about if, if we want to talk a little bit about security and innovation, I don't think that security and cybersecurity and innovation have to be one or the other, right? It's, it's not a zero-sum zero, zero sum game. They, they can work together and they can collaborate. In, in, in fact, First Data has been driving innovative solutions over the past couple of years and increasing our ability to give innovative solutions to our customers and to our clients, whether it's at the point of sale, whether it's on your mobile device, or whether it's in e-commerce, all the while doing it in a safe and secure manner. So our merchants are secure and their clients are secure, so then they know that you go buy something at the store that your payment is that your payment and your information is, is safe and just to, just to kind of frame that just a little bit about from a, from my organization which is the cybersecurity organization at first data how, how do we frame that issue right and, and the way we approach it is looking at what's the motivation that somebody would want to attack first data what, what do we have there's something of value that they can sell there's something of, of, of value that they can sell or trade, or there's some information that they can use to get a competitive advantage. And we think about payment card data, obviously a very large market for, for selling and, tra and trafficking payment card data, and so that's a, that's a great target. So once we understand what that target is, then we start changing our security paradigm a little bit and, and, and figuring out how do we protect that target, how do we make that target valueless. And how, and how do we take away the reason for somebody to attack us? And you have your, you have your typical security, right? You, you still have your typical security measures that you want to do, but then you think about what else can you do to, to shrink in that perimeter, to devalue that data? A colleague of mine was telling me a story about his grandfather he used to go fishing every day, year after year, at this old lake. Right, right next to a coal mine. Why did he go there? Because every time he threw his, his hook in the water, he was pulling out fish. Right? Until, until the coal mine next door decided to shut down and it released everything into the pond. There was no more fish. People stopped going there. That's what we want to do. We want to, we want to get rid of the fish from our pond, make that information valueless. But it doesn't come at the, it doesn't come at the, at the uh, 
uh, uh, inhibiting the consumer from doing their job. We can offer secure solutions, and we do offer source secure solutions, and so do others in the payment industry, where a consumer can go and make a, make a transaction, and the merchant who's accepting that con transaction can have some confidence that the transaction is secure. Tokenization, encryption, uh, protecting the data, you know, you, the, the, the payments that are happening on devices now are, are secure payments. Our, our point of sale solution and our merchant solutions for big and small merchants, they're secure payments and they're innovative because they allow the merchants to continue to conduct business and provides them ways to expand their business. Right? Not only are we just accepting transactions now, but we're not enabling customers to do, uh, consumers to do, uh, and merchants to do things like loyalty, rewards, track your business, look at how your business is doing compared to other businesses in the region, and really giving them the tools to run a business, and especially if you're a small merchant. If you're, if you're Ron's sandwich shop, I know about making sandwiches, but I don't know about security, and I probably don't want to know about security. But I want to know that who I'm working with is going to give me a solution to be secure and also that it's going to enable me to run my business. And that's innovative and it's secure and they don't fight each other. So there's ways to do it together. So uh, having your credit card hacked is unpleasant. Some of the things that Fran Townsend has dealt with are way more unpleasant than that uh, <laughs> from the national security perspective. To tell us, again, how do we strike this balance? So I would start with, I mean, uncharacteristic for me, good news. Um, so, you know, during the Bush administration, we started on the cyber issue um, with a classified presidential directive. The good news here is that from that point on, the cybersecurity and cyber policy has been in a very hyper-partisan town, very acrimonious, consistently of the highest priority. That classified presidential decision directive was handed over to the Obama administration that worked against the, what was contained there, declassified it, and then moved cybersecurity and cyber policy forward in a consistent, persistent way. That's now been handed over to the Trump administration who are working on their cyber strategy, um, which I expect you'll see, if not the end of this year, by the beginning of next. Um, and look, I, I think each successive administration has built on the accomplishments of the other, others. Is there more to be done? There most certainly is. Um, for one thing, unlike sort of the National Counterterrorism <laughs> Center, which is a one-stop shop for the president, when the president has to make a decision or is confronting a threat or an incident, there is one place to go to get an integrated picture. There isn't one place to go for the president now where he has all the tools of national power at his disposal and an integrated picture. And I, talk to the Obama administration, I'm talking to the Trump administration about having a national cyber center. You need more than just getting bits of information from Cyber Command and DHS and FBI. The president is entitled to, deserves an integrated picture and all the tools of national power in one place so that he can make judgments about how to deploy them. Um, the other piece to this is, as you mentioned, Brian, striking the balance, you know, now having spent almost 10 years in the private sector. We ought to be honest about the relationship between the tech community uh, and the government. And it is one of deep suspicion and deep skepticism and some resentment. There, I think the Obama administration and, and now the Trump administration has worked to get that on a more even keel. But in the end, I sit on a number of public boards, in the end, the fiduciary responsibility is to the shareholder, not to the government. Um, and so what that relationship is has to, you know, the government needs to understand the private sector's responsibility to their shareholders when it's a public company and respect that. It may be, and again, this is another I, mo notion that I've it's sort of socialized with the Obama administration, now the Trump administration, it may be an easier relationship if there is a non-governmental third party in the center. Whether or not First Data is willing to share information with the government, they have to make both a security judgment and a business judgment. And in the end, if, if the business judgment is that there is too much reputational risk to share that information, they're not going to share it. So if you can mask that data, if First Data and other financial institutions can put all their threat information and the cyber signatures into a third party entity, 
that masks where it came from and protects them and ensures that that can only be unmasked with legal process that they and their lawyers can be confident about, um, you reduce the risk on the private sector. And so I think the government, while we've talked a great deal about public-private partnerships, given the, the level of distrust, they have to think of a new model. And I think this is one of the ways to do that. So, so that's really interesting. And you know, Josh, we, you're just the guy to respond to that. Give us, tell us a little bit about the, the Information Technology Council and the role that you play. And I think it's important to say you, you, are, you, you have the major tech companies, you are in the United States, but you're also dealing globally. So, so you can give us a broader perspective. Great. Thanks, Brian. And, and thanks to Meridian. Um, absolutely. I mean, the first thing I'll say is uh, I agree with Fran, and I'll get to that uh, in a minute. My organization, ITI, represents, I think now it's 62 uh, of the world's largest technology companies, about 70% are U.S. headquartered, uh, the rest are in Asia and Europe, but every single one of them is a global company. And uh, frequently, people that I uh, talk to, my counterparts within the companies, will say, you know, I sit in Washington or I sit in Silicon Valley, but I, I spend my days thinking as much about Brussels or Beijing or New Delhi uh, as Washington. And, and the reason is because um, the, they're moving data everywhere all the time, and it's not just for them, it's for their customers, which is essentially ends up being the rest of the economy. And so we often will uh, you know, put forward the slogan that the issues we're working on, they're not really tech policy issues, they're global business issues, they're global job creation issues, they're global growth issues. Um, which means that uh, it is absolutely critical um, particularly given the level of companies' understanding of cybersecurity technologies and practices and so forth that you have uh, very deep cooperation both between companies and national governments, but across governments. And in a way, this is a perfect example of the theme today is how to, um, how to avoid, I mean, advance national interest in a globalized society, but in a, in a finer point kind of way, how to avoid uh, sort of collectively perverse policy results uh, flowing from nationally rational policy making processes. Um, to, to speak nationally for a minute, Fran's right. I mean, there, there has historically been uh, distrust between companies and the government. It seems to be moving in the right direction. Uh, we were very pleased with the um, the direction that things started to go in the Obama administration and uh, are optimistic as well about the Trump administration. There, there really should be uh, very little daylight, although the fiduciary duty issue is certainly a, a structural difference. Um, uh, at the same time, companies in the private sector have a pretty fundamental role to play in, in enabling and just being a part of the international conversations that happen because we can have the best possible information sharing uh, structure and understanding in the United States or in Germany or in Japan, but if it's not uh, part of a more integrated global conversation, it, it's not going to do us a lot of good. So, Fran, you, you touch on this. That is, is this something that has to be government-driven? I mean, do we need a, a, a new series of laws here? Is this, is this a regulatory solution to get to where you want? Or, as, as you know, Josh is suggesting, maybe there's a, you know, a, a private partner partnership here. How, how does that come about? No, the, look, I don't think that this is an area where regulation will be particularly helpful. You know, it, Ron was talking about you've got big businesses and small businesses. This is not, this is not an area where you want a Sarbanes-Oxley, right? And you want to layer into businesses requirements that may not be relevant across the board. And so, and I think you've got to respect that Oftentimes, it's the technology community uh, and the technologists that understand best what the requirements are. And so, no, I don't think it's a regulatory solution. I did at one point, in speaking to folks at Wharton, talk about there are ways of incentivizing best practices and behavior. So one of them, we see now an increasing market for cyber insurance. Um, boards of directors are talking about whether or not companies should have it, what price to pay for it, and what do you get from it. And one of the ways that you can incentivize best practices is to have the insurance industry say there's a bill, a bill of good health 
basically. And your insurance rates on cyber insurance will be reduced if you have these certain minimum standards. I think that there is a business solution here that should not be government regulated, and it will be more effective. Yeah. So Ron, a few months ago, somebody got a hold of my debit card. I've been meaning to ask you about this. <laughs> it wasn't me. Oh, no. <laughs> they, they drained my bank account, which, which was a pretty small pond. So, um, but I, I went to the bank and said, you know, this whole had, had happened. I knew I would have been at actually at Reagan Airport, and I, I knew the, the ATM and the whole deal, and I had, I had taken down all the details, and I was like, you know, I was going to get these guys. <laughs> and they, the bank very graciously put the money back in, and I said, well, what about the investigation? And they're like, eh, don't worry about it. I said, really? They said, nah, we just write this off. And it struck me as, you know, this is a tiny little thing, but it, it, are we dealing with a world in which this is inevitable <laughs> And, there, and that, that it becomes just a cost of doing business and, and at, at multiple levels, at my bank account and at enormous levels, do we just have to accept that there's, an, there's, a, there's gonna be breaches of multiple kinds and we just live with it? Well, well I don't know if we have to accept it, right? But, but, but when we talk about what we're doing when, when, from a cybersecurity perspective, I like to assume that. I like to assume that it's not, it's not if I'm going to have a cybersecurity, uh, not when I'm going to have a security problem, but I'm going to have one. And then I start building out my defenses like that way. So, I, so, I'm, so I'm being not only, re so I'm not only just reacting to the problem, but I'm trying to be proactive. Look at, what, look at what threats look like. Look at what your attack framework looks like. How do people get to you? What do they want to get from you? And build out that security and assume, assume you have that problem. So then you can get, uh, go and get resources and, and uh, technology solutions to help for your monitoring of your, of your devices, for your monitoring of your, of your network, and continue uh, with the assumption that there is going to be a problem and build out. Now, from, from that side, I think there is, you know, from the investigative side, a data compromise, right? There, there's a lot of cars out there. There's a lot of merchants out there. And not everybody has the same level of security. And that's what we're trying to do uh, in, in, in these innovative solutions is to give merchants and to give banks and to give, you know, people who are accepting payments ways to do that in a, in a secure fashion so they don't have to have a gigantic security budget and give them the solution to, do, to, to take a secure payment and still enable their business. And I, as we start pushing that out, as, as, we start adopt, as, as more people start adopting that, uh, I think that we, we reduce the risk of that, but there, there always is going to be that risk. And so it's a matter of, I think it's just how do we, you know, how do we, how do we assume it's going to happen and how do we start putting in uh, ways to, to be able to, uh, ways to be able to react to it, and then if we know what's going to happen, how can we start preventing it? Yeah. Brian, I, I would say it's, it's worth, I, I think most people don't realize the magnitude of the problem you've just identified, right? So financial institutions write off hundreds of millions of dollars a year in this kind of fraud. They protect the numbers incredibly closely. Much of it they do not ever report to the government, and that's because of the reputational risk. They don't want other customers to be aware of your incident and put together, and, and they frankly carefully, carefully guard the amount that they write off in this sort of fraud every year. And what, one of the reasons I suggested having a third-party entity to mask it is you create a safer environment for the government to understand the magnitude of this sort of crime and be able to put together, looking at the threat vectors, whether or not it's state-sponsored or large international criminal organizations. And that really, by and large, goes uninvestigated right now. And it's a tremendous loss to the banks and to the economy. Yeah. Okay. I'm onto something here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to follow up. I'm going to get those guys. <laughs> um, Josh, talk, talk about from the international perspective. You're, you're dealing with nations that are, de that are wrestling. Well, everybody's wrestling with these same issues, right? And, and yeah. who's, who's, who's managing this in a, in, a, in a good way that we can learn from? Yeah, let, I, I'll get to that. But actually, a thought I wanted to share that I think is, is relevant to this has to do, it, it, relevant to this idea of reconciling and aligning national and international approaches has to do with how we think about securing data. And the point would be to say location matters, but it doesn't matter in the way that you would think. Um, so a lot of countries around the world, China, some in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, for different reasons in Europe, but there are some requirements there. Th there are national measures that, that data stay within the territory of the country as a condition for being used, as a condition for doing business. The, the experience of our companies and, and the way that they secure data moves in the opposite direction of that principle. 
um, which is counterintuitive, but is what they find, that having to isolate the storage and management of, of data in specific places actually increases the vulnerability, that security turns uh, less on location and more on the, the practices and the technology that's used to secure it. And so uh, that is a, a principle that sort of animates how we think about um, international uh, collaboration. The, um, the U.S. government, the Obama administration, and it appears that, that it will uh, hopefully continue under the Trump administration, had a, a good and growing record of international cooperation on cybersecurity issues, a number of dialogues, uh, a lot of bilateral uh, discussions. Many people may know Chris Painter from the State Department who, who, who led a lot of those efforts over about five or six years. Um, as you would suspect, many of the, the best partners out there align with, with uh, the, the best U.S. allies, Germany, Japan, uh, South Korea. Um, but interestingly, there were positive discussions happening with, with markets that you wouldn't expect, um, like China um, and, and, and some others. And so uh, the, the, there is an imperative co to continue that cooperation, and, and we're just really hopeful that the, the Trump team will do that. Good. I see the little blue bird that Frank is holding up, which uh, tells me Twitter has intervened. Uh, we have a question from Twitter. We what actually have a question from Facebook Live. Um, so this is from Henry Patterson who asked the panel, do you think we will ever go to a paperless money system, become totally digitized? What are the pros and cons? Okay, who wants to take that? Yeah. We're on your... Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a cybersecurity person, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know that we'll ever go totally paperless. And, and I think it's there are some... Uh, I had some meetings with some, some of our international partners that do have a, uh, you know, a, almost a cashless society. But I think we've seen over the, over the course of the past couple of years, you know, innovation in, in mobile wallet, mobile payment, things like Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Loop Pay. Right now you can go, if I want to get my coffee, I can order it on my phone and I show up there, it's already done. I never have to open up my wallet, I never have to take out some money. Um, so, I, so I think, you know, will we ever be cashless? I, I don't think so. I don't know. I have not, it's not really a field of my study, but I know that what we're seeing now with the mobile wallet and, and, the, and the digital device that everybody's carrying on them all the time, you know, uh, a lot of innovation towards that type of commerce, and I think that's only going to continue to continue to grow. New, new, uh, new solutions, new security solutions to the consumer. Turn your card on and off. Turn your bank on and off right from your phone, and we'll see some development along those lines. But Fran, from a from a privacy perspective, do we want to be? cashless. Right. So the, the question really said, what are the pros and cons? I think we have to understand, you know, we normally talk about the privacy uh, issue in the context of what do I want the government to know? But we recognize, look, when you go onto Amazon and you do a search and all of a sudden it shows you things that you had clicked on previously, that all of these transactions are now the subject of artificial intelligence. Um, and more and more, there will be patterns and things understood about you that are, are opaque to you, that you don't realize that this collection and big data will allow artificial intelligence to paint a picture of you. Um, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but it's, it's something that happens sort of behind the screen that you don't really are conscious of. Um, and that's one of the downsides yeah. to these we, digitization. I want it. I want to ask Josh for his thought on that, but you, know, you, you mentioned artificial intelligence, Internet of Things. We'll have to do this in part two because we're, we're going to get to the next level of complexity very soon, but, right. and it's going to pause all these same questions in a deeper way. But uh, just on the cashless notion, um, Josh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I don't know that I have any kind of special perspective, but I, I tend to agree with Ron. I mean, there will always, I think, be a cybersecurity expert or you know, Ron Sandwich Shop, there will always be a, uh, a visceral, hopefully <laughs> diminishing distrust, uh, but, but a small visceral doubt at least about um, the security of digital technologies just as a matter of human nature. Hopefully we, we get it down very small, but I, I think there'll still be some paper. Great. Right there. All right, well, common ground in Washington, I'll take that as a win. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for your insights. This was fascinating. <laughs>